I wanted and was grateful to be a part of, uh, both my wife and I, of the Lambeth Conference. And in some ways, they're parallels in the fact that a part of what emerged at the Lambeth Conference over the course of the close to two weeks that we had together was the recognition of the fact that it used to be, in fact, um, there is there's lines in the hymnal that indicate this, particularly the day is now ended in the evening prayer rite, that give you the sense that if I'm going to Nairobi or Singapore or Fairbanks, Alaska, or Caracas, and I walk into a church related to the communion, I'm gonna hear, perhaps in a different language, but the same kind of liturgy theologically, and I'm gonna hear the same doctrine. That's not true now. It's just not. And, um, and because that's the case in many ways, a part of what happened over the course of this Lambeth Conference was an attempt to try to think about how do we think about our common life together now? Not how it was 75 years ago, but how it is now. And how do we find ways to be able to move forward? So the whole kind of communion across difference language that was a part of the life of the Episcopal Church in many ways was carried over, not directly by us, but there was the same sort of sentiment saying, okay, things really are different now and what do we do? I have to tell you that in many ways, uh, kudos should be given specifically to Archbishop Justin and Caroline for the tremendous leadership that they provided leading up to the Lambeth Conference. The language that's used for what's happening is actually phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one was what was described as listening together, involving bishops taking part in small online discussion groups. I was a part of one of those groups led by a bishop from Ghana. Um, and we would talk personally together. Of course, the archbishop traveled to literally, I think every single see globally to try to build the kind of support that would allow us to be able to come together. Because as many of you know, it wasn't all that long ago that such a meeting might not have actually even happened. Um, and then phase two was the actual conference itself being described as walking together, the person, physical in-person gathering of bishops at Canterbury in July and August. And then phase three has to do with how do we live this out? What kinds of relationships are being formed? What, ca what can we find a way to do together in the midst of the differences that we in fact have? Um, I want to read you a quote from one letter describing Bishop Justin's role. Before I go on to describe what happened, it must be said that the Archbishop Justin invested an enormous amount of energy and time in the conference. He spoke many times at least three plenary addresses, and I think most of the Bible expositions on 1 Peter, which really was the grounding text for those two weeks. He was front and center and relating to all bishops and spouses. I found even a Congolese bishop wandering on the campus with his wife and a taxi driver finding out where to register. He'd just come from Heathrow and he was lost and it was 10 at, 10 at night. I was able to lead them to the registration center, which was still open, thankfully. But right in the middle of that, the archbishop came down the stairs from a meeting, I presume, and immediately started talking to the Congolese bishop, engaging he and his wife in French in a way that made them feel completely welcome and at home. Uh, remember, you're talking about a thousand people who are there spread all across the University of Kent campus. And in fact, quite honestly, if you, if you weren't ambulatory, it was difficult. Um, you had to walk and walk long ways from meeting to meeting. At least in my uh, personal experience, that wound up being a tremendous advantage um, in the sense that it, for some, in some of those cases, it gave my wife and I an opportunity going from here to there, which is like 20 to 25 minutes, to process what it was that we had gone through. But also, in my small group and in other groups, I intentionally sought out spending time with bishops who were in the teeth of the strongest places of persecution. That was sort of who I wanted to speak with. I talked with a bishop from Burma, from Pakistan, spent time with a bishop in South Sudan, who was actually a part of the small group that I attended. And here, here's how this is, and if you've been in some of those parts of the country, you'll understand what I mean. 
they don't want to tell you the bad stuff. Nor do they even want to particularly brag about themselves, even though these are incredible paragons of leadership. And so what happens is, is that you walk side by side. You're not looking at each other. You raise questions. You get reticent, brief answers. But the more the conversation is allowed to develop, the more in-depth the answers become. And you finally begin to hear what it's really like on the ground to serve as a bishop in places where people are in peril, specifically because of who they are as believers in Jesus Christ. And I was just floored, honestly, uh, by their wisdom, the depth, their strategic thinking about all of that in, in the midst of extraordinarily complex situations, and genuinely their courage. There are places where they go that, where they may not come back and on a parish visit. And I've only had the, uh, the briefest of tastes of that, not here. <laughs> I've never felt in peril in any way in Central Florida. Um, but I still remember one time when I was in Northern Uganda, and that was in the midst of what was described as a war, really, dealing with a group called the LRA, which stood for the Lord's Resistance Army, a paramilitary occult organization that was raiding villages, capturing child soldiers, things like that. And the bishop who was with me and I would meet with the local constable to figure out where we could go to visit. And the criteria was how many ambushes had happened on that road from here to there in, in the most frequent way. And the one that had had the least amount of ambushes in the past two weeks would be the place where we would go and visit. Now, and. God was very gracious. I never felt that I was in a seriously life-threatening situation. But this is their daily, regular life in terms of what they live and understand. And speaking the gospel into places where people can and have, in some cases, lost everything. Um, I, it really challenged me because, quite honestly, they're the people, in my opinion, where we need to be focusing our attention and our resources. Um, as I said, rather bluntly, in a private meeting of the House of Bishops while we were there, I said, look, you know, it honestly doesn't matter to most of us what the communion says or does. I mean, we're gonna do what we wanna do regardless. So if there are resolutions that are passed and we don't wanna agree with them, we are not gonna do them. We'll say that they're non-binding, which in fact they are, non-binding, and we'll do whatever we want to do. That's our history, right? You know, I mean, it's like, it's not like I'm telling stories here. And, uh, and I said, so what we need to be thinking about is the pronouncements that we make and the impact they will have on the people for whom the, some of our comments, in fact, could be life-threatening for them. And that that's where our attention goes. And, uh, and that was the thing that I kept talking about pretty much everywhere I went, uh, or in pretty much every single small group that I attended. I, uh, it was enormous. I want you to see, these are documents that came out of the Lambeth Conference. I mean, it added five pounds to my backpack. Um, and, and so there were a whole series of what was called calls. Now that language was used intentionally. A call, in, a th in other words, is a way of thinking about, number one, what is the mind of the house, meaning those gathered, around a particular subject? And then that is, at that point, turned over to a phase three team uh, that is going to refine the language and try to challenge us to think carefully about how we can live into these calls. So I just want to let you know that that's the, the way this is being described. So if you want to say that doesn't have anything to do with us because, you know, that's not, bind, they're non-binding and they're not resolutions. That's only technically true. I mean, honestly, if we are members of the communion and if we are constituent members of the communion, which we are, and that's particularly true for clergy, 
You're not just a priest here for Central Florida. If you show up in the middle of nowhere and you find a little Anglican church, you're still father or mother and you're recognized for your holy orders. Same is true for me. And that's a part of how we understand the very nature of our ordination. And therefore, these calls should, in fact, matter. And in fact, a part of what I'm, I'm trying to say to the communion partner bishops is that that's particularly true for us that even highlight that. You know what both the liberals and the conservatives do with bishops from other parts of the world? And it's the worst kind of, um, uh, I can't think of a word that I want to say in public about it. Um, <laughs> if we can find an African or um, someone from the Far East, but mostly Africa, because that really is in some ways the gravitational center of a lot of what's happening in Africa. Who will support our position? No matter where it is on the spectrum, we'll pay, for the, mo we'll pay the money to get that guy over, mostly men. We'll bring them up and say, yeah, we're, see, we're really our global Anglicans here because this bishop and that group of people agree with our position. And then we pay their money and send them home. Never mind that the concerns that they have in the life of their province, like climate change issues, for example, because in certain parts of the South Seas, the sea levels are riding and rising in a way that churches located on islands could disappear. Uh, things like that, that's not on our screen. We don't even care, quite frankly. And if we are in fact really going to be communion partners, then we need to think very, very carefully about the things that are coming out of the Lambeth Calls and say, how can we actually function as partners with the rest of the communion, even if those resolutions or ideas or calls don't have traction for us for their sake, for their sake, we should find a way to support them. That is thinking very differently from the way most Episcopalians, regardless of theological perspective, think about the rest of the communion. We really do need a generation of leaders who are committed to living at a global level what it genuinely means to be Episcopalian slash Anglican. Because let me tell you, there are plenty of people from the global south who are really tired of being used, regardless of the theological perspective it does feel like at its best tokenism. So liberal, conservative, moderate sisters and brothers in the Diocese of Central Florida. Uh, I wanna just briefly file by title and make a comment about each of the calls. They're all like right here. Uh, but I do wanna say to you that all these are, or at this point, they're mind of the house statements. They are not formal, declarations, they still need to be refined. What happened was each of us as small groups got one of these, we read them over, we offered changes, modifications, those were recorded, all of those comments have been gathered together, they will have a direct impact on the final um, documentation that we are going to be seeing and I cannot tell you what the timeline of that is. But I do know that phase three is kicking in, the Bishop of Panama is now the head of the group, Julio I think is his name, and um, we'll see where we go from there. Understand, what happened at Lambeth actually was a reframing and a re-relational connection for us as a communion. I mean, that in essence is what was accomplished. And I have to say parenthetically that the people with whom I was in fact the most proud were the Global South Fellowship that remained there, they did not receive communion, and they said, we are not joining anybody else. We are going to be in the Anglican communion no matter what. And in a way, that really was their statement contra GAFCON and the other efforts that are being made to try to pull the communion apart. And I, they're, they're paying a price for that. And I was extremely great, grateful for the courage of their witness. Um, I don't agree, obviously, but I want you to know that I'm still proud of them and happy, really happy that they were there, particularly given the fact that many of those places are the places where persecution is the strongest. So, Anglican identity, these are not in any particular order. An effort to try to redefine what, how we identify ourselves as Anglican. 
Um, in a way, I was very surprised by it because it, was, it took such a hardline approach to how we've always understood ourselves, and it has to do with the instruments of unity. Archbishop of Canterbury, Lambeth Conference, Anglican Consultative Council, primates meeting. In other words, if you're going to be an Anglican, that's the body of people to whom you're willing to identify and submit. Um, where does that leave ACNA? Way over here someplace, in a way that honestly I found personally surprising. But that is in fact what came out. There was a whole piece on science and faith and a very clear statement uh, that the call, particularly in this day and age, would be to bring global faith leaders together to begin to work hand in hand with the best that science has to offer to try to deal with the folklore, the politically driven um, statements contra science uh, across the globe in a way that would allow us to, in essence, speak for truth and for the, the respect that we have for the scientific method as a way of trying to discover what it is that God has given us in nature. Um, the third was environment and sustainable development that has everything to do with how we build relationships together with one another, particularly as it relates to matters of the environmental crisis that is, in fact, upon us. The environmental crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution is an existential threat to millions of people and species of plants and animals across the globe. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned us that this is co-red for humanity, now or never. If you want to limit global warming, drastic action is needed in the next three years to bring, house, bring down greenhouse gas emissions. How can we find a way to collaborate, particularly with those people for whom this is a bread and butter issue, because it's actually threatening how they live? Uh, discipleship, all of the things that I would certainly rejoice in in terms of defining discipleship as your ongoing transformation in Jesus Christ. And what does that look like in making it very clear that discipleship is in fact one of the primary calls of the church? We tell, we teach, we tend to human need, we work together and pray for transformation, and we treasure the life that God has given us. Many churches, quite frankly, have dropped the whole understanding of discipleship and limited their role to the pastoral care of people who show up. That is not the same as discipleship. Uh, human dignity, of course, this is one of the ones that had the most controversial uh, piece in it, particularly as it related to gay and lesbians and the role that they play in the life of the church. Um, and so this is the one that was the longest as a result and the one that is requiring the most ongoing transmission and uh, amendment to say, how can we find a way to live together, especially given the fact that we are so fundamentally divided on the issues that are contained within this document. So no surprise, another one is reconciliation and about trying to find a way to say, what do we have in common in Christ? You, you see, the divisions as I see it, and this is true within the Episcopal Church as well, is that you've got a group of people who are calling for, in essence, baptismal formation in a way that builds unity, even in the midst of our divisions. But you have both sides of the fence, if there is one, who, who would not want to do that, because they would see that as compromise, in a way either that mistreats the minority that is being ignored, specifically gay, lesbian, and transgendered people. So what's that? Is that justice? And can I ignore that call to justice for the sake of people like you who don't even want them around? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sort of you know, exaggerating a little, but not a lot. And then you've got people on the other side to say, but you've changed the gospel to which I can no longer assent. How can I remain in communion with you? I mean, that's really where things are at the poles. And some of that continues to foster among all of us as it relates to, get, we sort of deal with this because this is both the language of our culture as well as what's happening within the life of the church, which is why, God, we need the Lord's wisdom in the midst of all of that. 
because if we cannot provide some kind of common witness together, particularly here in the States and in other places, that really wants to take advantage of our, our divisions for the sake of political gain, where we in fact are co-opted and therefore used for a po particular political end in a way that really, in my opinion, betrays the gospel, uh, then we're the losers. We're the losers in that situation. So not only in, in, around those areas, but of course particularly around issues of race reconciliation in terms of racial injustice and dealing with the ongoing challenge that racism is an issue here in Central Florida as well as in other places. Uh, particularly talk, if you have any questions about whether that's true or not, um, talk to the clergy in our midst who are serving congregations that have a substantial population of people of color. Ask them to tell you their stories about what they experience right now in Central Florida as it relates to matters of race, including comments from fellow parishioners who are not of the same color as they are. That's fresh. Just yesterday, I was in a conversation with a priest about this very issue, about a racist comment that was made about, about his child. And um, so this has not gone away. The laws are better but it's a matter of the heart. And that's why we need to have conversations together because quite honestly, there are plenty of people who when they make a comment they've only heard for decades, they're not aware that what they're really doing is in fact insulting a particular racial heritage. We need to learn together, in other words. We need to learn together. A uh, safe church that has everything to do with what you would think about, which means perpetrators of sexual or um, violence. Um, and the challenge particularly about as a global communion finding ways to train leaders in cross-cultural sensitivity as it relates to these matters of abuse. Not just sort of seeing it through our lens. And what do we do about that so that we really can guarantee? You need to know that when conversations like, that, like this at Lambeth, that was probably the first time particularly some of the wives who themselves had been taught to be silent, heard from the front, from the Archbishop of Canterbury and others, that the way you're being mistreated is mistreatment. I mean, we've wrestled with these things for a long time, not that we've got them sort of knocked, by the way, but for many of the people in that room, that was first time information. And one of the, um, <laughs> one of the unhappy secrets about this, even the sexuality debates is that while on the one hand, we're wrestling with this issue as it relates to gay, lesbian, and transgender people, Africa is wrestling with the fact that as divorce is not legal, there are plenty of clergy who have quote unquote wives simultaneously in several places with children. Um, and that's considered normal life. Uh, and that's been a part of a tribal heritage for a very, very long time. A and so, yeah, it may be in Nigeria, for example, a capital offense to engage in homosexual activity, which is horrific in the extreme. But these are also sometimes some of the same bishops that toot that the loudest who have children in different places. And so to try to again think globally about this requires all of us to have these sorts of conversations together because that in fact helps us take away some of the sting about they versus us because the truth of the matter is is that all of us are culturally conditioned in many of these ways that in fact don't necessarily look like Jesus and I would include myself in that. So in the midst of those sometimes really hard and difficult conversations there were extraordinary times of prayer, glo glorious worship services, everything from just tremendous, you know, classical choir music from Canterbury Cathedral to a phenomenal worship band that was just, everything was just the excellence of it and the passion for Christ that was expressed through it was, at least for me, 
uh, an extraordinary blessing. I'd come into the cathedral or where we were gathering in worship and I'd just exhale again. I, I really feel like in many ways um, the reshaping of the communion is just getting started. And I'm, I really have a lot of hope for the future. And we're all trying to find our way in the midst of all of this, both in terms of the Episcopal Church, but also in terms of the communion. And I, I think we're on the right road. I'm excited, quite frankly. It's hard. There is lots of compromise. It is not easy. We cannot go back. And if your call, with, regardless of where you are, is to try to go back, you're going to be lost in the, the cultural and even the church flow of where it is that we are headed. And so it's going to take a lot of work and prayer, difficult conversations. Uh, I'm just trying to sort of do my part in these last few months to continue to lay that kind of groundwork. I look forward to how this will continue to move forward with or without me in terms of the future. And as I said at the beginning, God used the Lambeth Conference to change my life. So thank you.